morning, turn to hymn number 351, Tell It to Jesus. Okay, we can always go to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in prayer. Hymn 351, Tell It to Jesus. We'll sing all four stanzas. Three fifty one, tell it to Jesus. All four stanzas. Ready? Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus, he is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. <coughs> Do the tears flow down your cheeks unbidden? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Have you sins to men's eyes have hidden? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Do you fear the gathering clouds of sorrow? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. Are you anxious? What shall be tomorrow? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Are you troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. For Christ's coming kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus Tell it to Jesus, he is a friend that's well known. You've no other such a friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus alone. Okay, great. Uh, let's have you turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy 3.1. I believe one reason why there are so many people in the world that are depressed, that have problems, that are stressed out, that can't sleep, is because they don't tell their problems to Jesus. They hold it in. And uh, there's no reason for us to hold it in. Jesus is there for us to tell him whenever we have a problem to be solved. I'm just so glad that I have a Savior I can talk to. I'm just so glad that our God is not silent and we have to solve all of our problems ourselves. I'm so glad I don't believe in evolution, thinking I am the highest form of creation where... I am a God, and then when I, have no, when I have problems, I have no one to go to. I have to solve it myself. I really love the fact that God can solve our problems. I love the fact that we can tell all of our problems to Jesus. And there are many Christians that don't tell their problems to Jesus, and those are the ones that are depressed. Those are the ones that are always unhappy. I think we need to tell Jesus everything that we need, and he will provide for us. 
God has never left us to fend off for ourselves. We have an almighty God, and his resources are infinite. That's what I love about God. Well, that's not my message today, but I like that song. And uh, <clears throat> I think if we practice what that song does, it would relieve us a lot of the problems we have right now. First Timothy 3, 1. <clears throat> This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, nor striker, nor greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, we want to thank you that you're with us. We just pray that um, you continue to keep us and protect us from the virus, that we can continue to serve you. And uh, also, we just pray that this year we can tell more of our problems and our concerns to Jesus. We need to change the way we think about you every time that something comes in our way. We tell it to Jesus and that would change our lives for this year. We want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So um, the next thing is, uh, here's a question I have for you in the audience. Okay. It's a loaded question because I know you know the answer. But at the same time, the answer I have is not the answer that I'm looking for. Okay. The question is, and I'm going to ask Amy, what makes... Christianity different from all the other religions. Okay, Amy. Okay, she said our God what, Mel? It's actually a true God. Oh. Well, how how do we how do we know the others aren't true God? Okay, but that wasn't my question. Sean, what makes Christianity different from all the other religions, so called religions? That's right. Fulfill prophecy. You see, you talk to a Buddhist, a Buddhist will think, oh, yeah, our God is the true God. You talk to somebody that is a Muslim, they will say, our God is the true God. So, which is what makes our God different? The difference that we have prophecy. That was what I was talking about in the year 2020. No other religion. No other God, no other prophet, no other scripture, no other book has prophecy. Well, there's a second thing that our Christianity has that no other religions have, no other gods have. Okay, And I'm not expecting you to guess the correct answer on this one because I have to do lots of research. Our Christianity has one thing different from all the other Christianities in that our Christianity preaches against adultery. That our Christianity practices fidelity. That our Christianity speaks against immorality. Okay, So for some of you that are a little bit younger, this message may not be exactly the one that, you know, it's an it's a adult message. Just keep that in mind. Uh, so Christianity is a moral religion, okay? None of the others have morality, okay? So when you talk to another one, you, you can point that out. We have fulfilled prophecy, and we have morality. So since the beginning of time, when Christianity and, of course, Judaism started, all the other empires practiced other gods. Their other gods were all immoral, okay? The Egyptian gods, the Assyrian gods, the Babylonian gods all practiced immorality. You had to sacrifice in front of their gods, or you would have to visit the temple prostitutes, the Greeks. So if you wanted to visit the temple of Diana, and the temple of Diana was in Ephesus, uh, you would have to commit immorality with the the prostitutes of that area. Uh, and then the Romans, uh, their god was Zeus. Zeus himself, the god, committed immorality. 
So ever since the beginning of time, one thing that's different with our God is our God is moral. Well, let's go on. Uh, we have other religions, okay? And the first one I will speak on is Islam. The word Islam and the word Muslim. Okay, Islam is the faith. Muslim is the, the people who practice Islam. So something that the people that are Muslims will not tell you is in the Quran, their prophet Muhammad was very, very immoral. He had lots of wives and he was a pedophile. Okay, so he had immorality with girls and they won't tell you that. But in France, okay, in France, there was a newspaper that published the fact that that uh, Mohammed had immorality, was a pedophile, and uh, that newspaper got bombed. And one teacher mentioned that, and the Muslim, some Muslim cut off his head. Because, but this is the honest truth. If it weren't true, why would they react like that? And his idea of heaven, okay, he doesn't call it heaven, he calls it paradise. His idea of paradise is some immoral immoral harem sexual fantasy with 77 virgins. That's his idea of heaven. I got news for you. Our heaven, okay, their paradise is immoral. Our heaven is far greater than what God can describe in the Bible, okay? And uh, that's, that's one big difference. I would say the Muslim would be the number two after Christianity. And look at what the Muslims have to look forward to. Immorality here, immorality in the skies. And like Melvin says, our heaven is infinitely greater than what life is like here. But the Muslim heaven is like earth. Immorality here, immorality there. Not much hope for a Muslim. The Hindis. The Hindis are just as bad. According to the Hindis, you can have immorality, you can have many wives, and they actual, actually have a temple, and the temple has all these immoral structures and carvings of all the immoral things that you can do. So how do I know that ours is true? We got prophecy, but we have a moral God, okay? Our true God is moral. Their God is immoral. The Buddhist, I actually read it. For the Buddhists, you can have many wives, okay? You can be immoral. There's nothing that says you cannot commit immorality as a Buddhist, okay? Our God says this is definitely wrong. In the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then God talks about in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, what are the forms of immorality? No other religion, not even the Buddhists, will mention these are the forms that you cannot practice, that homosexuality is wrong, that pedophilia is wrong, other things are wrong. God is a moral God. Well, how is our Christianity better than the other religions? Ours, I don't believe ours is a religion. It's the true God. All the others are the fake, uh, fake gods, and they are the religions. Our God is moral. Our Bible is very moral. God has a high standard. And, I've, of course, I read um, the pastors ought to be moral. Let me go on. And then the reason I wrote this is because last week Melvin spoke about Martin Luther King, and he mentioned that Martin Luther King's probably not a Christian because Martin Luther King believed in his message that the, uh, all these people are the children of God, okay, like the Jews and the Gentiles and the Christians and the Catholics and the Protestants, and he went on. I'm so, but anyway, um, then I thought of other reasons why I believe he's not a Christian. But let me go on. The Catholics. So the Catholics, you would think they would be immoral until the Pope announced last year it's okay to be gay. Well, you know what? I didn't know the Bible said that. The Bible says the opposite. The Pope rewrote the Bible, okay? And they believe that the Pope's word is equal to God's word. So that's how I know that theirs is not true, okay? Everyone believes theirs is true, but ours is different. Ours is moral. Here's another one. Uh, the Mormons, okay? 
the Mormons founded by Joseph Smith. Um, basically, um, he believes that you can have as many wives as you can. Okay, and uh, of course, um, it it says that according to their Book of Mormons. Okay. And so therefore, they don't believe in this book. They believe in some other shenanigans book right here. So they are an immoral religion. Of course, they don't want to call themselves Mormon anymore. They're, they call themselves Christians, okay? Latter-day Saints, whatever that means, okay? So how is our God different? Our Bible is very explicit in what is morality and what is immorality. Here's one, leaders, okay? So... Um, because uh, there are, are many good leaders, and Melvin talked about you know Martin Luther King, so I might as well talk about Martin Luther King. Um, I believe that Martin Luther King was a good political leader. There are many political leaders who want more, um, who believe in the doctrine that all men are created equal. Okay, and of course, back in the 1960s, he wanted the fact that blacks should be equal as whites. Good political leader, but not a doctor or not. A lot of people will call him Dr. Martin Luther King. I got news for you. He's not a doctor. He's ne never healed anybody. Okay. And they will call him Reverend Martin Luther King. I refuse to call him Reverend Martin Luther King because he is not a reverend. And the reason he's not a reverend is because he went to prostitutes in many different cities. He didn't really care about going to prostitutes. If he were the man of God, he would say, this is the Bible. The Bible says it's wrong to go to prostitutes. Therefore, you cannot call him a reverend. Okay? And then you would say, well, Nathan, the doctor is an honorary doctor. You're a doctor of divinity. Okay? You cannot be a doctor of divinity if you don't believe in the divine God who wrote this Bible. So I refuse to call him Dr. Martin Luther King. I refuse to call him Reverend Martin Luther King. I just call him MLK, okay? Make life easier, okay? And uh, he is a junior, though. Um, but he believes that all men ought to be equal, but he got his doctrine from Gandhi, okay? And remember Gandhi, okay, so Martin Luther King was in the 1960s. Remember Gandhi? Gandhi was in the 1940s. And Gandhi believed that all men are created equal, that the Indians should be equal to the Brits, which is, he's a great political leader. But morally, he is immoral, okay? He slept with nude girls, underage girls, and he himself was nude, okay? So Dr. Martin, whoa, I, I blew it right there. MLK says, Gandhi is my inspiration. Well, yeah, see what Gandhi did immorally? So <clears throat> he's a leader, but he is not a, a spiritual leader, okay? Gandhi's not a spiritual leader. Martin Luther King is not a spiritual leader. And the last person I'm going to talk about when it comes to all men created equal is probably the man who wrote that phrase, all men are created equal. So I will ask... Um, Brandon, who wrote the phrase, all men are created equal? Okay, Gibson. Benny? Willie? What? Thomas Jefferson was the one who wrote in the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. So let's face it. Martin Luther King said all men are created equal. He got it from Gandhi. Gandhi said all men are created equal. He got it from Thomas Jefferson in near 1776. Well, what kind of life is Thomas Jefferson? Well, I got news for you. Thomas Jefferson was not a Christian, okay? And the reason I know Thomas Jefferson is not a Christian is because Thomas Jefferson committed immorality with his slaves, okay? He was married, yet he never practiced the Bible. So I could say this, you can be a great political leader, but you cannot be a spiritual leader if you break the Bible. And I'm not gonna name all the presidents that were immoral, I'm sure they were good presidents, 
but they were all immoral. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, John F. Kennedy, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, and Obama. You say, Obama? Obama never committed immorality. No, but Obama is the one responsible in telling that the United States ought to accept gay marriage. That is not the Bible. He claims to be a Christian. He's not. The Bible doesn't say that's right. Obama is the one for why America has gay marriage today. Okay? He's the one that appointed the judges that supported gay marriage. And since we're talking about, Melvin was talking about Biden. Joe Biden now wants to propose laws for transgender people. I'm not going to talk about what transgender people are. You just go and figure it out. That is against the word of God. Okay, So, yeah, we need to pray that America, you know, let's face it. Uh, when Obama took over, America got worse morally. I just pray that Biden doesn't take us down the road morally in, you know, immoral America. Now, we also have another high standard. Our religious leaders ought to be immoral. But one of the problems is the devil knows that if he hits the religious leader, then those who are the followers will become immoral also. So let's read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Now, what does the word bishop mean? I looked it up in Greek, okay? So the Greek doesn't say bishop. I think uh, back when they translated the King James Bible during the year of, what year was it, Mel, when King was James? 16, what? What? 1611. 16, 11. So you guys remember that date. You know, I, can, I should be able to remember that because the pilgrims uh, landed in 1620, okay? And... John Smith was 1607, so four years. I don't know how to do the math here, but 1611. It's the same King James. Anyway, so they didn't know how to translate the word, but the word in Greek is, I'm going to do it. Okay, and uh, the, the word in Greek is this. Okay, so we all know what this word means. Okay, so I'm going to ask you what this word means. So, um, Ivy, what does this word mean? It's an English word, right? Okay, what does scope mean? Okay, I'm not going to pronounce it scopy or whatever, but do you know what scope means? Okay, so I'm going to use several words that use scope. Telescope, microscope, and that's all I can think of. Endoscope. So, what, what do you say, Mel? Periscope. Oh, yeah. Peris periscope. Okay, so, Gibson, what, what does the word scope mean? What? To look, okay, to see, okay? So, when you use a microscope, you're seeing these little bacteria. When you use a telescope, you're seeing very far away. Tele means far and scope to see. Overscope. I have no idea what overscope, but it means this. The one that looks, and, and I think that's the word that Gibson used. The one that looks over all the Christians. Okay? And Okay, the one that looks over the Christians, it's like a shepherd. The shepherd looks, watches over his flock. So if I were to reread this, uh, I would say, if any man desires to be a pastor, okay? A pastor is the one that looks over his flock. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Spanish word for sheep um, is pastor, right? If you want to order a certain type of foods is a pastor food, okay? So the word to look over would be translated today as pastor, but back then they had no pastor in the King James Day. King James Day, they were either bishops or uh, priests or reverends or something like that, okay? So 
If any man desires the office of a pastor, he desires a good work. Verse 2. The pastor then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And here's one. Melvin talks about drinking all the time or not drinking. Verse number three, not given to wine. Okay, so that's very obvious. So therefore, when we have the Lord's Supper, it cannot be wine. Why? Because verse number three says it cannot be wine. So, so the pastor needs to be moral. It, some people believe the pastor cannot be divorced. The pastor can only have one wife, not two wives. The Mormons practice multiple wives. And uh, so, um, so the devil wants to attack Christians and attack pastors, not because they don't believe in the Bible. It's because you attack the pastor and then, therefore, the followers, the, the, the followers that they look over will also become immoral. Uh, recently on the news, there's been several religious televangelists who have fallen because of immorality. Okay? Uh, just last year, the president of Liberty Baptist University, uh, the largest Southern Baptist University in Virginia, has to resign because of immorality, okay? And another televangelist, uh, there's this uh, televangelist for the Hills, Hillsong Church. You know, I had fishy feelings about the guy when I saw him speak with spiky hair. Any, anyone who has spiky hair, there gotta be something wrong with him. And then it was discovered that he went on the internet looking for a prostitute and had immorality with the prostitute, and the prostitute never knew who he was. Then one day she turned on TV, oh, there he is, and then she tells the whole world, he has to resign. But that's not, so that's, that's bad, okay? But the pastor before him at Hillsong also had to resign for immorality. You know, Mel Melvin always talks about these churches with you know their rock music and spiky hair or whatever they're doing. Uh, there's, there's a pattern, okay? Um, here's another televangelist, um, Jimmy Swagger, okay? Uh, he ran the Jimmy Swagger Bible Colleges in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, he was caught with a prostitute, and he has not resigned, but he's still on TV. Watch out for these people. Another one, Oral Roberts. He had the Oral Roberts University for Pentecostals in Tulsa, Oklahoma, had a medical center and a dental Dental school, you know, my friend who couldn't get into any dental schools in America. Uh, you know, let me tell you, folk, young people, how to get into medical school and dental school. Number one, do not go to the hardest school in America and lower your GPA. Do not go to Lowell High School uh, or UC Berkeley. <laughs> and number two, do not pick the hardest major. So my friend, Stephen, he picked the hardest major, uh, bio you know, engineering or whatever it is, biophysics. He picked the hardest major. He got a bad GPA. Uh, he went to one of the toughest schools. I know he's smarter than me because he was smarter than me at Lowell High School, but I picked the easy San Francisco State, picked the easiest major, cell and molecular biology. Sounds, sounds hard, but it was easy. And uh, he had a bad GPA. He could not accept, get accepted to any dental schools in America. I think one reason I got in is because I serve God. And because if you serve God, God has an interest that you are successful. And this guy, he wasn't serving God. And then there's only one school that accepted him into dental school. And Betty, guess what dental school that was? Okay. Oral Roberts University. Okay, the Pentecostal one. And by the way, for those of you who are listening... Uh, in TV land, Oral Roberts University Dental School does not exist anymore, neither the medical school. In fact, the whole school fell after the, the Oral Roberts Jr. Ha had divorced, okay? And, uh, you know, this is not only a men problem. Uh, on TV, you'll turn on and you'll see Joyce Myers, okay? Some woman preacher, all she does is talk, all she wants is your money, okay? She doesn't even preach the Bible, 
and she has this big empire. She has millions of dollars of housing on, in, some, in Florida, and now she divorced her husband. She doesn't need her husband. So I got news for you. The Bible says in verse number three, uh, chapter three, First Timothy, chapter uh, verse two, a pastor must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine. So one sign of where Christianity is different from the rest is we have a moral God, we have a moral Bible. If your spiritual leaders are immoral, then you don't have Christianity. And uh, I personally have known, okay, I've shaken hands with them, lots of pastors in the Bay Area that have committed immorality and that have resigned. So what makes our God the true God? Fulfilled scripture and morality. We live in San Francisco, okay? Because we live in San Francisco, San Francisco has no morality, okay? San Francisco's anti-God. They teach evolution in the schools. They teach everything is okay, okay? There is no morality. You can be gay or straight or transgender or, you know, you know lesbian. You can be, be all these things, but this is not the Bible, okay? God will only honor what is written in the Word of God. So the re one reason why it's so important that the pastor be moral is because the pastor and the church is a picture of Jesus and the church. The pastor has to be moral because Jesus is moral. Jesus is the groom. The church is the bride. Jesus is the overseer. Jesus is the ultimate pastor. The reason God has morality is because God wants the best for all of us Christians. None of the other religions care about their people. Okay? They have no morality. God wants the best, and that's why we have the true God. God will not allow for other perversions to take over and hijack our, our religion. So uh, let me just um, uh, end the message in a nutshell. <clears throat> We have the true God. We have a moral God. We have a God that fulfills prophecy. None of the other religions are moral. And the leaders, okay, do not confuse a leader like MLK as a spiritual leader. They are political leaders. And last of all, hold your pastors accountable and your televangelists that they also have to abide by this. Satan wants to make each one of the televangelists fall. He wants to make all the pastors fall. We need to be true to the word of God, and God will bless us. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, we want to thank you that we belong to Christianity, the only moral religion out there. We have the only moral God. We want to thank you that you are the true God. You have provided for our needs, and we want to thank you that You've given us the morality so we can live happier lives, more fulfilled lives, and a picture of what heaven is like. We want to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please open your hymn books to hymn number 23, There's Power in the Blood, hymn 23, uh, first, second, and last stanza. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. 
There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Okay, so those of you that are here, we still have plenty of refreshments and chocolates out there. So after we dismiss, you can help yourself to get as much chocolate as you want uh, outside over there. All right, so let's end with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can meet here in the house of God and worship you. And thank you that you're, you're the same yesterday, today, forever. We can still honor and glorify you. You are a moral God, as, as Nathan said, that the Bible has fulfilled prophecy. And we can always trust in you. So be with us as we go our ways this coming week and bring us back next Sunday that we can still come out and worship you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless you. Have a good week. And you are dismissed. Okay. We got